like to ask you, how many of you have seen this uh, TV series on Netflix, All the Light We Cannot See? It's so beautiful, right? I really encourage everyone to watch this, uh, uh, this TV series. Of course, this is uh, this based from a, a book, uh, and its author is uh, John Doerr. And uh, in fact, like, I, I, I borrowed the audiobook, and I'm going to listen to it. Okay? And this is a story between a blind French teenager and a German soldier. Don't worry, I, I won't tell the whole story here. Okay? <laughs> so while they were young, they were living in two different countries, they were listening to this, uh, to this professor on this radio station. And there's a lot of like, kids who were like, listening to this professor. And their, their paths cross at St. Malo, which is a, a, a place in a small town in France. When I saw, saw St. Malo, oh, it's so beautiful. I'd like to go there someday and, and, and have a visit. And at that time, St. Malo was occupied by the Nazis during the World War II. Okay? So these two characters in, in the story, they were trying to survive the devastation of World War II. And as we know, World War II started in September in 1939, and a lot of like European countries were occupied, right? And they were waiting. They were waiting for the Allied forces to come and liberate them, right? And, and they don't know how long will the, will the war last, okay? It could be many, many years. So they were just waiting. And we know on June 6, 1944, what does that, what's the significance of that day? June 6, 1944. It's the D-Day, right? The D-Day in Normandy, France, where it starts with a long and costly campaign to liberate Northwest Europe from Nazi occupation. And we know in May 1945, that's the VE Day, which is the victory in Europe, where these countries in Europe were really liberated. And why am I sharing you this? It's because just like the, the people in Europe, they were waiting for the Allied forces to save them, to liberate them from the Nazis. It's also the same for the Jewish people, right? For so many centuries, right from the very start, from, from Adam and Eve, where it was promised to them, an offspring of a woman will crush the serpent's head. And from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down to David, the Jewish people were waiting, waiting for this Messiah to come. And we know Jesus came, the, Jesus the Messiah, came 2,000 years ago. He was born in Bethlehem. He came in the flesh and in weakness. And we see the great humility of this King of kings, the Lord of lords, who is the Son of God. The great humility of Jesus that he was born in a manger with animals. And we know in his weakness, he suffered and died on the cross in order to redeem us. And Advent is from the word, Latin word Adventus, means coming. And this refers to the first coming of Jesus on Christmas Day. But it's not just on the first coming. We also need to focus on the two other comings. What are those two? The one is the final coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of us Christians, we're groaning, we're waiting when is he coming? Right? In, in, and in this coming, he comes not in weakness. He comes in glory and in majesty at the end of the world. There's a scripture passage that depicts that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 21, St. Paul said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, the glory of the final coming of our Lord. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God 
to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. That's what we are all are awaiting for. We just don't know when, right? For the final coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another coming, which is the middle coming. This middle coming is not physical, but in spirit. St. Bernard of Clairvaux talks about this middle coming. He said, this middle coming is like a road that leads from the first coming to the final coming. So th this connects, this middle coming connects the first coming and the final coming. At first, Christ was our redemption. At the last, he will become manifest as our life. But in this middle way, this middle coming, he is our rest and our consolation. And then he continued, if you think that I'm inventing what I'm saying about the middle coming, listen to the Lord himself. And he's going to be quoting scripture. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words and the Father will love him and we shall come to him. That's the middle coming, right? Jesus coming to us in spirit. And he wants to come to us, right? And he comes to us more especially in the sacraments. Whenever the priest would administer the sacraments, baptism, confession, whatever, it is Jesus himself administering the sacrament. The priest is there is in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. It is Jesus who is administering the sacraments and most especially in the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, it's not the, the, the bread and the wine is not just a symbol of the body and blood of Christ. In the Eucharist, it is the real presence of Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. He's present there. And when he's present in the Eucharist, he's also very present in the blessed sacrament, right? That's why Jesus instituted the priesthood, so that the priest will be able to consecrate the bread and the wine, so that it will become the body and blood of Jesus. So that the, 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 the promise of Jesus will be fulfilled. The promise in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of times. As long as there's a priest, there's going to be a Eucharist. And when there's a Eucharist, Jesus will be there. Okay? Now, how many of you here have done some adoration before the Blessed Sacrament? Okay, good. Good number. Okay. Maybe some people have tried it and then didn't continue. And I can't blame them. You know, maybe some of them have tried coming before the Blessed Sacrament and in silence, it's as if that God is disinterested in them. That's why God is not speaking to them. Maybe they also think that, oh, I'm before the Blessed Sacrament. Nothing is happening. Nothing is changing in me. Nothing is happening. And they look at the watch. Oh, it's a waste of time. I'll leave. Right? But the Lord speaks to us in the Blessed Sacrament. Okay? God speaks to us in the, in, in the Blessed Sacrament because God has only one message. What is that one message? His unconditional love for each and every one of us. He has only one word to say to us, and that is His eternal Son, Jesus, who is the Word of God. And He has only one language, and that language is silence. That's why when you're, when you're in silence, don't think that 
God is not speaking to you. He is. He is speaking to you in silence because that's his language. Okay? That's why we need to open our ears and hear him speak into our hearts. Now, when we come before the Blessed Sacrament also, there's things happening. Okay? I'd like to quote with you, uh, to you uh, from a book, A Life of Adoration, uh, written by Marie Benoit Angot. And she wrote this, the more we fix our gaze on the living person, living person of Jesus, the more he will transform us and fill us with joy. How many of you here wants to experience more joy? Okay. Go before the Blessed Sacrament, okay? Because there's transformation there and then there's joy that you will experience. She continued, True adoration changes our hearts. A change takes place gently and little by little within us. That's why we don't recognize it, right? Sometimes even without our knowledge, even if the initial encounter happens suddenly, conversion is a path which continues for the rest of our lives. Okay? So it's not just initial conversion. It's ongoing conversion. A purification is necessary, leading to transformation. That's why when we come before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, He's purifying us from our sins. And by that, He is transforming us. I'm reading this book, Insinu Yesu, uh, a private revelation uh, given by Jesus to a Benedictine monk. And Jesus told this Benedictine monk this, although I am coming and coming soon, he's talking about the final coming, I am already present. Jesus is talking about the middle coming. Look at my Eucharistic face. Know that I am here for you in the sacrament of my love. I am here to console you, to comfort and instruct you, to give you an experience of my divine friendship already here in this life so as to prepare you for the glories of friendship in the next. Do you see the connection? What the Lord is doing with us in this middle coming in order to prepare us for this final coming. And when we come before the Lord, we're like clays, like clays, okay? And we let God, who is our Father, to form us, okay? That's, that's in our first reading today. In our first reading today from Isaiah chapter 63, verse 8, it says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that the transformation happens only before the Blessed Sacrament. Okay? The Lord can transform us if we allow him in our trials, in our sufferings, in whatever. He can transform us. Okay? But the most powerful transformation happens before the Blessed Sacrament because he is present there, really. Okay? And just like a clay, right? The potter will form the clay. And that's what we want. The Father will form us to, so that we will become more and more like Jesus. And the potter, after forming the clay, what does he do? What does he do with a, with a, with a, with a clay pot? Huh? He puts it in the fire, right? So that it will harden the clay pot. After that, will the potter will be able to change the shape? Yes or no? No. It's the same. When Jesus comes, it's like us, clay, whatever shape we are, we're going to be put to the fire. And there's no more transformation that's going to happen. You got it? Right? So that's why, and the thing is, we don't know when he will come. In our gospel, it says there, beware, keep alert, for you do not know 
when the time will come. When he comes, it's too late. No more transformation can happen. So let's make the most of our earthly life here to be transformed so that we become more and more like Jesus. I found a scripture passage that is very fitting. I hope you find it very fitting that speaks about what this middle coming do to us and that it will prepare us for this final coming. Can we all read this together from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23? Let's say it together. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it fitting, this scripture passage? Read, meditate upon this scripture passage, okay? So Advent is not just focusing on the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we, we commemorate his first coming when he was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. But we also need to focus on the two other comings. The middle coming, when Jesus comes in spirit, right? In the Eucharist, most especially in the Eucharist, in the Blessed Sacrament. And it has the power to transform us to become more like him in order to prepare us for his final coming. 